This is an update to my global winners portfolio, which looks across five groups of exchange traded funds and chooses the best fund based on risk adjusted return. So it's a momentum strategy, which is very useful for keeping abreast of what's going on in markets, but also helping us to think about the drivers behind those changes. Now, if you follow my portfolio on stockcar.io, which is actually sponsoring this video, you'll be able to track any of these changes which I make as I make them. So let's look at my global winners portfolio in a bit more detail. So I've just updated the portfolio. So if you want to find it on stockcar.io, you just go to this search bar up at the top and type in Romin, and that should bring up the portfolio. Here it is, Romin's global winners. So we just click on that. And these are the changes I've made this month. So I've sold Peru and I've bought Qatar. So that's the change we've made, and that's on the country grouping of ETFs. Now, if we scroll down, you can actually see what's in the portfolio. So you can see Peru, I bought, now I've sold, and I've sold at a loss of 7% because the momentum reversed very quickly, but all of the rest of the portfolio is as it was before. So here's a quick reminder of how the portfolio works. These are the five groups of ETFs which we consider. We've got 44 countries, 18 factors, 11 sectors, eight commodities, and nine bond funds to choose from. And one of the funds from each of those groups will make it through to the portfolio based on its risk-adjusted return. Let's begin by looking at how well we performed over the last month. So beside me here, you can see the five choices we made last month alongside SPY, which is the S&P tracker. Now, only one of the funds outperformed SPY over that month, which is our DB base metals fund. Base metals have been performing strongly over the last month, as have many commodities. Our choice in the bond category was CWB, which is a convertible bond fund. That actually was slightly underperforming the S&P. And then amongst factors, again, slight underperformance, there we've chosen the Russell 1000 Growth ETF. The S&P portfolio and the growth portfolio are pretty closely correlated at the moment because they're both driven strongly by mega caps in the S&P, companies like Apple and Microsoft, for example. However, the underperformance in our portfolio came from Technology Select, which is focused very much on just tech names. And the biggest underperformance came from our choice of Peru, where the performance actually fell very sharply over the course of this month. Now, what we can also do is imagine that we were God last month and we had perfect sight of which funds would perform best. Now, that would have been Turkey, which has actually bounced back from its massive sell-off over the course of this year. So maybe this is just a dead cap bounce for Turkey. It certainly hasn't solved its inflation problem or its problem with central bank independence. Energy, of course, is doing well because we saw the price of oil surge again, and that was probably driven by what's going on in Ukraine. And also we saw this sector, Energy Select, rally as a result of that oil price surge. In terms of factors, the factor which performed best was the most cautious one, which is minimum volatility. And in the bond space, convertible bonds perform the best, and that was also our choice for bonds this month. So one of our choices was spot on. Now let's look at our choices for this month, and we'll focus on our country choice because that's the only category where there's been a change. So here you can see the 143-day look-back period, and we're looking at risk-adjusted return. That's the return of each of the funds divided by their volatility. So very volatile funds will be scored down, even if they have a very good return. And over that period of time, you can see Qatar actually comes out on top by quite a large margin. Peru, which was our previous choice, has fallen into third place behind Saudi Arabia. Now, clearly that's driven by commodity prices, but there are also some other considerations. Here we can see the best three and the worst three performing ETFs over that period. And you can see that Qatar has come off the top slightly, but it's still doing pretty well over this look back period. In terms of return, in fact, it's actually behind Peru, but it has a lower volatility, which is why it gets scored higher. So if you want to find out a little bit more about that Qatar ETF, particularly what's in it, then we can use stock card to do that. So we just type QAT into the search bar and here's that ETF. 
So you can see how StockGuard describes each of the funds. And it also tells you about the kind of exposure you'll get with this Qatar ETF. So it's dividend paying, it's exposed to basic materials, it actually has a lot of banks inside the ETF, and of course it's non-US. So let's scoot down to see where the price is compared to prices over the last year. You can see it's towards the top of the range for Qatar, which is what you'd expect because this is a momentum strategy that we're using. And we can see the description of the fund here. Now, one thing I don't like about the fund is that it has a fairly high expense ratio of 0.57%. You'd expect that for something which is exposed to EM stocks, which usually have a bigger bid offer spread. But what I'm particularly interested in is the actual components, the stocks inside the fund. And if we look at the top holdings, you can see that there's a lot of financials, as we saw, so Qatar National Bank. Then we get our first commodity stock, that's Industries Qatar QSC. Then we get some more financials and another petrochemical company. Now, Qatar's been in the news recently because it's seen as an alternative source of energy for many countries which are switching their supply away from Russia. So Germany in particular is exposed to Russia and is very keen to get liquefied natural gas from Qatar. And there was an interesting interview on Bloomberg recently with this strategist who was talking about why she's overweight Qatar right now. And she points out the valuations there are relatively cheap. Also, she expects that the foreign ownership limits on their banks in Qatar will increase over the next nine months so we can get more exposure to the upside for Qatari financials. Looking forward even further, there are lots of infrastructure projects. Not all of those are in petrochemical projects but that should improve the prospects of the country as a whole. Of course, energy prices have been strong. That's obviously a boon to Qatar, but also it'll be hosting the FIFA World Cup. Not particularly interesting to me, I have to say, but that should provide a boost to the country, both in terms of standing, but also there should be some increased spending on infrastructure, which should benefit Qatari companies. Next, we'll look at factors where we haven't made a change this month. And you can see that IWF has still got the best risk-adjusted return over this look-back period of 947 days. Although it is looking as if IVW, which is a large cap growth ETF, is actually pretty close this month. Here you can see the returns of those funds over the look back period, and you can see that IWF is still above IVW. The volatility of the two is pretty similar, so that's why they're still pretty much neck and neck. Let's take a look at what's inside IVW just to see why it's holding up reasonably well. And I think this exposure summary is really useful. It tells us that it's got a lot of consumer cyclicals in it. So if there is a pullback in growth in the US, we should be worried about this exposure. Also, it has a lot of tech and a lot of mega caps inside it. So if we look at the weights of the largest stocks in the index, you can see it's dominated by those mega caps like Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Tesla, and Google. So it is pretty much the FAMG stocks. So these are even more concentrated than they would be in the S&P. Remember, these are the stocks which are pretty much holding up the S&P after the big sell-offs that we've seen over the course of this year. So if that continues to be the case, then this fund should hold up well. Now let's look at the sector choice. These are the 11 funds which we can choose from. And you can see that XLK, which is the Technology Select Spider Fund, that's still the one which is by a long way out in the lead. The next closest fund is the Consumer Discretionary Select Spider Fund. So again, this is giving us exposure to those tech mega caps, which have held up the S&P. And you can see that pretty clearly if you look at the returns over the look back period. Now let's look at commodities. And you can see that base metals is the best one again, based on risk adjusted return. Now, if we just looked at returns, you can see that energy would actually be out on top. And that is the one that's been trending up most recently. But if we plot the volatility of each of those commodity funds over time, and this is going back to the beginning of 2021, and it looks over a rolling 90 day period, energy is by far the most volatile. It's even more volatile than it is usually and the volatility is roughly 40%. And if we compare that with the volatility of DBB, which is the metals fund, that's got a volatility which is about half of that of DBE. It's usually hovering at around 20% vol. So that's why this fund scores more highly than DBE, even though energy has been trending upwards recently. Our final category is bonds. Now notice how many of these are now in negative territory, and that's because yields have been increasing very sharply over the course of 2022, as the Federal Reserve and other central banks normalize their monetary policy. So if you look at these lines beneath me, 
you can see that almost every one of these fixed income funds has been selling off very sharply over the course of this year. Generally, the ones with the greatest duration are sold off the most, like TLT, but even funds with very short duration, like SHY, have sold off sharply based on their very low volatility. Convertible bonds have also sold off, but that's a result of risk appetite falling and their equity exposure. But really, they're the best of a bad bunch in this kind of environment. So this month, we stick with CWB as our choice for our bond fund. Now, if you do have exposure to fixed income, it has been very brutal this year. And in fact, if you look at this tweet from Danny Berger from Bloomberg, you can see that this is in fact the worst drawdown ever for TLT. And that's over the course of the last two years. So there we are. Those are our choices for April and the reasons behind them. You can follow the portfolio for free on stockcar.io. And if you use our special promo code, which is pensioncraft with no spaces, you get 10% off a full VIP membership. And you can also find out more about that by clicking on the link in the description below. And as always, thank you for listening.